Welcome to the Roundtable Consult. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Williams, and I'm joined as always by my wonderful co-host, attorney Sonia Madison. Greetings and salutations, Sonia. Hey, you almost got a graduate on your hands. How you doing? I'm fantastic. I'm excited about it, you know, so she's uh, about ready to graduate in just a month from now. She'll be no longer a high school student, and several months from now, we will be, quote unquote, empty nesters and so <laughs> <laughs> has she had prom yet have, have promise promise this afternoon so this evening so we, we've got uh plenty of things to look forward to she's out getting her hair hair done and prepared right now so okay. Okay. we'll wait to see what happens she's a beautiful young lady though <laughs> and and that's just not me being biased a biased father but she is just beautiful inside and out and uh, it's good when all your friends can say about you that, you know, you're the one who makes wise decisions and, you know, who they go to for counsel and things of that nature. I was like, oh, that's kind of nice. Then I wonder sometimes, is that too much pressure to put on a kid? <laughs> well, nah, they're one of mine. You've never heard that before. So I don't know if you can speak to that pressure. You know, she, hey, <laughs> she, she, for advice. she takes after dad, dear old dad. And, <laughs> uh, you know, and I've always been mature for my age. That's why I married an older woman. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're excited about it. Promise today. And she's very reasonable and rational about the, um, about the expenses involved with it, as far as I can tell, you know, sometimes I'm not privy to these type of ex these types of discussions and expenditures because my wife might want to keep those things separate from me. Like we're planning her graduation party, and I have no idea how much we've already spent in just decorations alone. So, <laughs> and sometimes I don't think I want to know. I was gonna say, you just know you're gonna love it. <laughs> hey, but here's the other thing that she did. She and I'm so proud. I'm just spending first couple of minutes bragging about my daughter. But um, she's she's going to she's decided she's going to go to Alabama A and M, HBCU, and she's got uh full tuition and books and everything already um, covered with just one scholarship. And she went uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we went to visit for their open house. She applied for, I mean, she auditioned for their choir, the university choir, and she got accepted. Okay. And she actually got a scholarship for that as well on the higher end of what they offer in terms of scholarships as well. And uh, so, you know, of course, as a proud dad, I had to stick my ear to the door as she was auditioning. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you did not give her any comments or critiques afterwards. I, I did not. She, I told her she did. Of course, she did a wonderful job. She's got a beautiful voice. She's an amazing talent in terms of uh, musical talent and um, excellent voice and incredible songwriter. I mean, the, the melodies that she hears, I'm like, I wish I could hear melodies that were that hooky and you know i do you know for those listeners and viewers who don't know i do actually write music and record as well i'm a recording artist in fact i released my project just a couple weeks ago entitled one touch now available on all streaming and download platforms uh, but i had to plug that anyway <laughs> but she um she's been writing since she's been eight years old and just one of the first songs that she wrote was just so ridiculously good it was a christmas song and you know we actually used to have these annual christmas parties we have a live band come out and they learned the song and we sang the song during her uh, uh during the party as well we usually have an open mic karaoke around the town when we did these christmas parties she came up at the age of eight years old sang her song and had the crowd just going at that point so not just because she was a little child but because it was a good song huh on the album she didn't come on the album. I did ask her. I just commissioned her services. There goes my purchase. <laughs> well, here's the deal. You know, I have a habit. Some somehow or another. If I think as a parent, sometimes if this is something that you do, and then you try to be too forceful on your children and try to involve them, engage them without them wanting to and without them showing an interest in doing such then it becomes a burden some woman. So I don't want singing to ever become a burden to her or a chore to her. And so I've always left it open for her to invite me into that aspect of her. She knows what I do. So if she invites me into that aspect of her world, then I will readily come. But I did just recently commission her to write a song that I want to put on one of my albums. And uh, that song I want to be about family. So she and one of my other sons sings as well. And I'd like to record a song with them. And uh, 
So she sent me a draft uh, earlier this week and it's good. It's a little dark. She do she does she she has a tendency to write a little bit dark tones and other things like that. I'm like, yeah, we might need to brighten it up a little bit, but and she, and for her, it's like no problem. I'll go back in and write something else because she's just that good. So, um, but anyway, that's enough of me bragging on my daughter. She's graduating. My last one will be out the house here soon, and uh, my wife will be going crazy. <laughs> well, I gotta plug in Alabama State because I mean I know that's their rival, but that's where my mom is. My mom's alma alma mater, so mm -hmm. I, you know I hate that she didn't consider consider the Yellow Jackets. Not at, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Not even. Not even a, a, a grazing we consideration. Actually, we were there at the the first campus of Alabama State. And so, <laughs> yeah, you didn't get it considered, huh? <laughs> not not even a consideration. <laughs> And I think some of it might have had to do with the majors that were the availability of majors. But I was quite impressed with the campus of uh, Alabama A and M. Um, I was impressed with it. it. It's a very nice, beautiful campus, and I think they say it's the largest HBCU campus in Alabama. And so it's um, small enough where I think she can get the attention and the uh, interaction that she needs without getting lost, but large enough where you can actually separate yourself from people that might be a little bit harmful or not good for you. <laughs> well, you know, since she's a dark writer sometimes, let's transition to Trump. <laughs> 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 I don't know if you heard Stephen A. Smith um, on Fox talking. I, about I have not. I have not. Talking about um, Black voters that empathize with Trump because of his legal issues right now. And he's gotten a lot of flack because um, he, he's saying, oh, the Black people that have those issues, um, they empathize with him because they feel like it's an unjust system. I'm like, hold on, don't don't dare compare systemic <laughs> <laughs> racism <laughs> in the prison system with the privilege that Donald Trump is getting to the point that he's sleeping in court. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> so for those that don't know, he's on trial for the hush money or for giving money to Stormy Daniels as a bribe, I guess, for the for the campaign. Um, and so, yeah, he's there's been a lot of talk about he's been disinterested as well as putting information out about jurors. Um, it's caused at least one. I think there may be others that have asked to be recused because mm. they're careful of their lives. Um, of course, judges the judge has in, <laughs> entered mini gag orders, but. You just can't stop that Trump train. <laughs> right. It's interesting. I think four of them had actually who had been seated were now removed just because by their request because uh because of the low level of anxiety and um the fear for their lives and everything. I think one of them as they were going through some of the rules, she was her anxiety was just going through the roof. She was like, I, I I don't think I can do this. You know, this is just too much for me. I can't do it. Can I be excused? And, you know, it's it's I'm pretty surprised that they were able to seat the number of jurors as quickly as they did. Uh, this was a pretty quick process, as, as opposed to when you start hearing about the, the, the whole RICO case in Georgia, how long it would take to seat jurors. I mean, the one case that she has pending right now is taking like eight months to seat jurors from there. But it seems to me that if you have a number of um, jurors that you can strike, and once you've exceeded all those uh, jurors that you can strike at lib at liberty, then um, you know you don't have much of a choice after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, interesting enough because I know one that has um, been removed. She spoke out and she said, I mean, part was the information that was divulged, and she had family members based on that information able to determine it was her. <laughs> it was calling her like, "Are you going to be okay about this?" <laughs> But she also mentioned that, um, you know, you get called into jury duty, but you don't know anything about the case. And so she said when she walked in and saw him, it was the first time she realized, oh, my gosh, they're asking me to be seated for, you know, a case against <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> so, uh, maybe that's to some degree the need to do it quickly is so that you, you know, don't get all, some of that bias seeped in or get people immediately trying to not show up yeah. <laughs> jury duty once they, once they feel like they're going to be called. Um, but interesting enough, I, I'm just, again, constantly amazed at the privilege this guy is getting as it relates to the justice system in the courts. Well, he has to almost. I don't know that there's, um, I didn't, I don't know if, if that's, 
avoidable because of who he is right now and the 70 million Americans who actually voted for him and the potential outcome it, or the narrative that would occur if they didn't bend over backwards. You know, granted, those on 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 the side of prosecution can, can get upset and can argue that, hey, he's getting all this privilege that other people wouldn't get. But they're not going to be as vociferous as those who would be his supporters who will argue if he gets convicted that this was all a kangaroo court. But that's uh, something you can't avoid. You can't avoid what his supporters are going to think. And so to try to appease them, knowing that they will never be satisfied, I don't think you can move that way. And I don't think mm -hmm. it's right or fair to move that way. I mean, I understand there will be some privilege by virtue of his position, but when someone is blatantly harassing um you know, the, not only the judge, but the judge's family. And it's got people so afraid to even be on a jury. I, mm. I mean, I think it's, it's taking this privilege a little too far. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I will say that um, it was interesting that the prosecution, when, when, the, when Donald Trump's attorneys wanted to get a list of the witnesses they expected to call it first, they declined and the judge agreed with them. I, I think they somehow retracted that over the past couple of days. How does that typically work? Um, well, and just so the viewers know, I don't do a lot of um, litigation. I definitely don't do criminal litigation. Uh, but, but from my understanding of the reports was the, his attorney called and asked for the list. And he said, no, because we know that your client is going to pretty much blast it. And he said, no, Trump said he's not going to do anything with it. <laughs> he was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you even say that with a straight face? And I'm right. like, <laughs> 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 um, but like you said, the judge agreed. Like, no, nah, I, don't, I don't trust that that's going to happen. And I wasn't aware that, whether they retracted that or not. Um, but, you know, if they so, have, maybe they gave him maybe just one or two names. But yeah, so I think eventually what happens, Donald Trump's attorneys came back and, and petitioned. They said, well, how about you give us access to the to the witness list and give us a court order that we're not able to share that with our, our with our client now go figure that his own attorneys are asking the judge to tell him order us not to share this with our client because you know otherwise it would help us it would it would help us to be able to say hey we can't share this with you because you know the, the judge told us not to now now, if that happens, and I think it did actually happen where the prosecutor said, we will share the information with you. But the minute one of their names show up on social media by Donald Trump, this will be the last time that that happens. And after listening to a lot of the commentaries, um, I was like, ah, yeah, a lot of people were saying that maybe that was a better decision from the from the judge rather than. Uh, just to blanketly say, no, he doesn't have to share that information with you. Because I understand you do actually have to know who the witnesses, who the intended witnesses are so that you can prepare your cross-examination of those witnesses, as opposed to having to broadly suspect in a list of 30, 40 witnesses or more, or something like that, um, that you have to just play whack-a-mole, try to figure out who's popping up next. So. Although they have a general idea who's all on the witness list. But um, I, I will say, I mean, I, I definitely understand the, the decision. I don't trust his lawyers more than I trust Trump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, I mean, I wouldn't, I still wouldn't be surprised if something gets leaked, even if it's not through Trump. Because I, I mean, again, like we talked about, he has his minions that he uses that gets that information out as well. I was a little disappointed with CNN because they also was that Vilgin, some of the information about the jurors. And I'm like, hey, come on. Right. You know, it's, right. it's too much um so but the news gotta be the news <laughs> the news can be the jury has been seated <laughs> yeah but you know if you're the one who breaks that information everybody there's a whole the whole rush for everybody to go ahead and break the information regardless of 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 what the consequences are this this is this is the perils of being in a capitalistic society it's that everybody wants that money that money drives what people do and and whether they will violate what would be perceived to be ethical principles for the sake of earning that money and you know we see that across the spectrum not just in the courts not just with the media but we see that in every aspect of our government 
and uh, which really brings us to our topic today when we start talking about the uh, unwinding of charity. And so what we, we chose that, that word unwinding in particular because there's this whole push, particularly after the pandemic, uh, to unwind Medicaid. And so unwinding it, meaning that you're getting rid of all these people who are on Medicaid, who are ineligible for Medicaid. So that's a little bit of background. Medicaid is a social welfare program uh, instituted by the government. Medicare, it started back in 19, I think, 65 with Medicare. So Medicare was a uh, part of the, I think it was a, part of the, the big new deal or something like that. I forget yeah, uh, which, huh? with, Along with social security. Yeah, that was part yeah. of the that yeah, was part of the New Deal. And so they were trying to provide social services for um, social welfare services for American people who are needy, particularly the elderly and the uh, the poor and the disabled. So Medicare was instituted as a federal government program to care for the elderly. Seems like a noble cause, right? I mean, that's that's almost biblical, right? And so along with that came uh, programs that would help to provide for the poor and, this, and the disabled. But those programs would be Medicaid and they would be administered by the individual states. Now, where the federal government got involved is, is that for every, I think it's every dollar that the state would provide, the federal government would match that dollar in contributions and the states had broad discretion about how they administered that program and who was eligible for it. So they would each set their own criteria to determine who's eligible for Medicaid in that state and, and how they would actually verify that and also renew the eligibility. And so since then, Medicaid has been ongoing and people have been applying for Medicaid, receiving Medicaid services. Around 2020 came, there was a, a huge spike in uh, enrollment for Medi Medicaid. Now, for years, people have been talking about Medicare and Medicaid fraud and, and how doctors have gotten over on the system by overbilling Medicare. And so they've instituted plans and programs to try to cut down on doctor-initiated fraud. There always been this discussion about Medicaid fraud, about who's ineligible for it. Even when I came to Tennessee, there were, there were many complaints. It was broadly accepted that there were a lot of people who existed in this state who were pretty well off, but still they were on the Medicaid program. You know, they, 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 they own, you know, fancy cars, nice house, <laughs> nice houses and took lavish vacations and still come to your office and present with a Medicaid card. And you wonder how can this be? And so there, there's always this suspicion of people gaming the system as always will happen, frankly. Uh, but in general, the, it was given to those people who had disabilities, uh, women with children who uh, were under a certain income guideline. Some states actually made it such that all children should be eligible for it. And then there was some question about whether or not immigrants should also be eligible for it. And so this is a whole broad topic of of how should Medicaid dollars be spent. And of course, it's determined by the states. So in 2020, with the pandemic, there were a lot of people who lost their jobs and, of course, who didn't have an income because of the impact of government closures. A lot of people enrolled in Medicaid and started having Medicaid services after the pandemic. Now they're starting to say, hey, the states can't really continue to sustain uh, this high uh, population of, uh, of, of, of clients receiving Medicaid services. So we're now intentionally all across this, the country, frankly, intentionally trying to cut back and unwind the Medicaid and, and the services provided to a bunch of people, making sure that people are, are eligible for it. So now comes the question, how is that process initiated? And is it initiated fairly? And, you know, what are the the consequences of it. We all know that it boils down to really trying to save money. And and that that almighty dollar motivates a lot of behaviors, as I've said before, not only in the judicial system, the political system, but also now apparently we see also in our healthcare system. And that can be applied broadly to the other social welfare programs, including like WIC, Women and Infant Children, and SSI, you name it, any number of the... Um, the government program. So 
what's your what's your understanding of some of this now? Um, well, I do want to make a quick correction. So I think you said, you know, Medicare is passed in the 60s. I think the New Deal was probably around the 30s or 40s. Um, and so it was an extension of the New Deal. So I just want to, you know, history is important. I want to make sure that's clear. Um, it, it's hard. And that's why I wanted you to kind of speak on a little bit, because I know you touch more of it. You probably see either a lot of patients or maybe a few patients that come in that are on that that program. Here in Georgia, we we do use some of it, but we've got a governor who's been adamant about not expanding it and, and kind of want to move towards de erasing it or deleting it. And his argument is, hey, you know, he feels like states should do their own program. And I think he started a program here, but there aren't nearly as many people signed up for it as people that are signed up for Medicare or Medicaid, both of them. Um, and and just again, from my because I again I don't do healthcare law. Um, one of the main distinctions, from my understanding, is you know Medicaid is more about the children, more about people who aren't as older, whereas Medicare is more about the elderly. And so, you know, I hate the idea of children who you know by no fault of their own can afford to care for their own health insurance and not being being covered. I know you guys still have an oath to to care for people even if they they can't pay, but nonetheless. Oaths, I will say this, oaths don't pay the bills. And I say that jokingly, but, you know, and I'll, and I'll explain later on what I, why, why I can retract that, but go ahead. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and I, I've said this before, I do think government should be about caring for the most vulnerable, and that is includes children. And if, of course, if we bring Christian into it, we are tasked to care for the poor and care for those that are less fortunate. I, I do get that we are in a trillion dollar deficit. And I think that, at least from my understanding, if they cut certain social welfare programs, which would include Medicaid, um, they're looking at over four point something trillion dollars in cuts. Um, it's also my understanding that Medicaid alone, as I think it's around 700 billion or so, is an expense to the government. Um, so, I mean, I get that, but at the same time, if, unless we're, we're seeing that it's not meeting the need, which I don't think we're seeing, I do think that it meets the need of, of caring for people who cannot afford to care for themselves, then I don't know if the solution is to cut it. I mean, maybe we can look at some other programs or maybe we can ask states to be more tasked about doing that. What gets me here about George is while he has started that at the same time, he's also been on this push to continue to cut income taxes. So then I'm like, okay, well, where are you going to get this money from? And I'm like you said, I mean, you know, I know you're going to talk a little bit more about the oath and whatnot, but nonetheless, someone's got to get paid from somewhere. <laughs> and, you know, if I, I understand that we hate to hear the concept that we have to pay it through our taxes, but I don't think that uh, to me, we're going to pay it anyways, whether it is going to be through um, welfare, whether it is going to be through, um, again, high sales tax, because people, you, you got a lot, a lot more or a lot less people being able to afford certain items. And so then the cost of that item goes up. I mean, we're going to pay for it in some shape or form. So I'd rather it see, go to someone's health care than <clears throat> to see it being inflated in, in a rich guy's wallet, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. they, 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 I think there's this, this, this statistic out there that says something that uh, the vast majority of the reason why people go into bankruptcy is because of health care costs. And you're right. If we don't pay for it on the front end, we're going to pay for it on the back end, which was the one of the initiatives of the Obamacare when he came into the office. He thought no American should go without insurance. And the reality of it is, is that often they don't. You know, they still go to the emergency department and they over overutilize the emergency department, which has um, an obligation to see all patients with emergencies. And you can't assess whether or not that person has an emergency until after you assess the patient. And so uh, so you've already used one of the most expensive vehicles of healthcare delivery to provide non-urgent care to a group of people who will resort to that system uh, because they don't have any other alternative and they know that that's the fail safe. So you got one of two options. You either give them an opportunity or a way to utilize the service that's on a compensated basis um, or you turn them away. 
and you well, two other options. Or you turn them away and say, ah, no, you don't have insurance. We're not going to treat you uh, regardless of if you have an emergency or not, because you can't assess if they have an emergency until after you've assessed them. So if if and I don't think that that is consistent with our humanity or at least our professed humanity as a country. And so people then go to the emergency department and then the those those expenses are written off by the hospital as bad debt. And so the cost of delivering healthcare service goes up because of the cost of bad debt or the contribution of bad debt. And so when you get a, a hospital bill that shows $80,000 bill, it's a charge that the hospital has. And those charges sometimes, and I always tell people, I said, don't be distracted by the charge. It's kind of like uh, the game whose line is it, is it anyway, where Drew Carey hosted it. He said, the points don't matter. The, the charges really don't matter because what really boils down to is what the insurance companies say, this is what we're going to pay you for this service. So it doesn't matter if you charge me $80,000, I'm going to say, well, insurance companies say, listen, you don't have patients anymore. Those patients are our patients. And if you're not in network with our insurance, then you don't get paid. You don't have patients to see. And so they negotiate a decrease in the payment of, of those charges, often like 30 cents on the dollar or something. And a lot of them base that off of Medicare. So Medicare is the one that really drives all this, the federal program that is instituted to provide care for the elderly, health care for the elderly. So they determine it. So if Medicare says, yeah, we're only going to pay $1,000 for this admission. It doesn't matter if you charge $8,000 or if you had $8,000 of expenses, you know, you're only going to get $1,000 for it. And then the commercial payers will say, okay, well, we're going to pay a percentage of Medicare. Some of them pay 120%, some pay 180%. Some places you might go and get, if you negotiate right, you can get 220% of Medicare. <clears throat> um, and so larger institutions who have more clout and more muscle than a solo practitioner like myself can negotiate better contracts with those insurance companies. And as a result, get compensated better. Um, and I'm and I'm sort of like bunny trailing over into something that I'm passionate about, though, because you know they just ought to really pay the you know the solo practitioner, the group practice, a little bit more affordable rate. Because if you don't pay them, they're going to quit. They're going to close down. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to join the larger institutions that get compensated two hundred percent of Medicare. So that's where that's where that those rates come in. Those charges come in. And that's how the insurance companies determine how much you're going to pay. Medicaid does the same thing. So Medicaid usually says, yeah, we're going to pay a percentage of Medicare, but often it's a lower percentage of Medicare. It's under 100%, maybe 85%, maybe 95%. And again, it's still based off of how you can negotiate those contracts with those Medicaid organizations. As I said, they're administered by the state and the state itself really usually doesn't administer the program. What they do is they hire out for-profit organizations called managed care organizations. In Tennessee, that's United Healthcare is one. And then um, a mayor group uh, is, a, is a larger group. They used to do one. And then Blue Cross Blue Shield has a product, uh, MCO, managed care organization that also administers Medicaid. And so those managed care organizations are profit-driven. And so when they say, when they because they know that they get paid by the state a certain amount of money per year per subscriber. And so they say, we're going to give you $10,000, for example, just a round number, ten thousand or $5,000 per subscriber per year. And so you got 300,000, you know, or, or 3 million people in the state on Medicare. So five thousand times three million that's what your budget is and so those medicare organizations those mcos have to manage that pot of money to say okay how are we going to allocate this out and so they start restricting how much access their subscribers can have to to those healthcare services because at the end of the day they exist to make money so the less money that you can spend on a person's health care the more profit those MCOs have. So that's what their incentive is. Their incentive is really to not provide good health care. Their incentive is to provide good returns on the investments of their shareholders. 
which is capitalism, right? That's the way that capitalism works. So that's a problem when you start putting healthcare and and human humanistic care or humanity and try to administer humanity through a capitalistic society. It just doesn't work because they want to try to save money. And it's always often at the expense of of healthcare and of other people's uh, well-being. Now, the, the piece about Medicaid, as I mentioned before, they usually pay less than Medicaid or Medicare. And as a consequence, not many providers in the city, in the state, actually accept it. In Nashville, <laughs> I'm probably one of the only ENTs who, I think I'm, I am the only ENT in this greater Nashville area who accepts all of the medic, all of the MCOs that administer Medicaid. And I keep wanting to let it go, but from a financial standpoint, or from a humanistic standpoint, I'm like, these people need help. They need care. And I need to find a more efficient way to deliver that care. And unfortunately, if you continue to do that, more of those people will start coming to you. And then next thing you know, your whole practice is consumed by Medicaid. And that's how I grew my practice was based on Medicaid. And so I started realizing that, hey, I'm getting busier and busier. But there is a law of diminishing returns. At some point or another, you expand your, your facilities and expand your human resources to accommodate this growing need of patient base. Then you start looking at the reimbursement that you're getting for it. You're saying, wait a minute, I'm losing money. by accept I'm seeing more patients, but I'm losing money. And that's an untenable situation for a businessman. And so that problem of Medicaid actually needs to be fixed uh, because we do need to find a way to better administer the care without necessarily having to either one, line the pockets of these large MCOs or two, starve the individual practices who are actually trying to provide the care for them. Well, and one of the things you, you brought up that I want to make sure is clear um, at least here in Georgia, one of the reasons why he doesn't want to expand it and bring people more to the state program is the state program requires people to still work. And I don't know if Medicaid in the general requires you to work, but here, if you participate in the state program, you have to work, I think, at least 80 hours or so. Um, and so in that, you know, if you've got a lot of people who are on Medicaid and they're or they're on it, like again, children who can't work, or um, or for whatever reason, um, and then you say, well, you got to go to the state program, but then the state programs requires you to work, and for whatever reason you can't, you know, you you get to that double edged sword. I also want to make sure it's clear, and just like you articulated, not a lot of um, hospitals or a lot of, of programs in those most vulnerable communities exist. You know, here in Georgia, we're just now beginning to rebuild an emergency hospital near the south side. But for a while, we had one and they left. It was, um, I want to say through Wellstar, but don't quote me on that. But they left um, because, one, they said they weren't getting enough revenue. But, two, I mean, they prefer to be on the north side. And they, they did have hospitals on the north side. But again, you there's multiple hospitals on the north side where there's not as much access to healthcare on the south side. So for people that are thinking, oh, these are just people who don't want to work and get free health care. Well, first of all, it's, it takes a trip to find the health care that you need <laughs> if you're in one of these communities. Um, and, and like you say, even if you're there, you're only going, you're probably dealing with one or two doctors that is having a responsibility over multiple patients. Um, and there's only so much time in the day that those one or two doctors can can handle. And, and again, like you said, if they're not getting paid the same amount as their counterparts on the north side, then they're likely counting their pennies until they can get to the north side um, so that they can, you know, again, live out the capitalistic way, right? You be able right. to make more money and without having to do nearly as much work. And so, I mean, that's that's also this narrative sometimes that I feel like the Republican Party or people that are against Medicaid have is always oh, just free insurance for people instead of them actually putting in the work to earn that type of um that type of care. But again, it's it's still they have to figure out how to get the care. I mean, that that takes some time and some effort. And then even once they are, are at the, the facility, they have to pray that the doctor is able to see them. Because I take it, you're likely probably going to see a physician assistant um, or a nurse. <laughs> um, and you're not going to go through the list of, oh, let me check everything. You're probably like, hey, what are your symptoms? And you're going directly to those symptoms and not necessarily looking at the, the whole body as, as a general whole. 
Now we do. I will tell you, tell you in our office, I, I employed two uh, physician assistants, and and to be able to see the physician assistant is is not is not any less of quality of care deliver. Uh, I've got two very competent PAs who are under my supervision, um, but you're right. They they they're compensated half or a third as much as some of the physicians are, and so the way that you make this financially doable is to say, okay, well they're going to be you're going to be seen by my physician assistant, and if you need additional service or just like anybody with commercial insurance, um, if you need additional consultation by the physician, then we're available for that. So that's one way that you can help reduce the cost of of, of administering excellent care still. Uh, in our office still, you know, we, I just can't be one of those microwave doctors, you know, you just come in and 30 seconds later, you know, you pop out with us with a prescription. I can't be one of those. I'm a, I call myself a crock pot doctor. I say I'm <laughs> slow cooker because I'm going to address all of your needs. And I'm going to educate you about your illness and everything, because I do believe that an educated patient is a compliant patient, but you're right. Time is money. Uh, so you, the goal is the way to make these things more, much more efficient and to see patients with Medicaid to make it efficient is to limit the um, cost effective, I should say, is to limit the amount of time that you're spending on on caring for these patients. In the office, it, it you know, you can try to move it along, but I, I make up that time in the operating room. Fortunately, I have, not that I'm rushing through my surgeries or anything, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't need to close that up. Just let it heal on its own. <laughs> you don't need the no. anesthesia. It's not going to bite, bite real hard. It. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the way that we do that is one, we do the surgeries, do the surgeries at a facility that's much more efficient. And in my case, many of my cases are short are really short procedures, 15 minute cases or something like that. Well, if it takes 30 minutes to turn a room over for a 15 minute case, then I'm wasting uh, an incredible amount of time. So often what happens is that the facility will give me two rooms. So when I finish in one room, I can go immediately to the next room while the first room is being turned over. And so that's there, there are ways to make it more efficient so that it uh, so that it becomes more cost effective to do that. And it benefits not only just the surgeon, but it also benefits the the patient. It benefits the facilities that administer these cares. But it takes some type of ingenuity and consistency and commitment in order to employ those strategies. What would be really nice is, is if that the states somehow mandated that the MCOs, you know, provide competitive reimbursement for those patients. But instead, what's happened is that the state man mandates that these managed care organizations, these MCOs, have a certain number of providers on their roster per capita of subscribers. So they may say you have to have one ENT per 100,000 uh, or per, per 50,000 subscribers. And you go on these websites and you can look at their provider network and I'm exposing the truth right now. Um, you go into their provider networks and you see that these MCOs are actually compliant because they have a long list of ENTs or, or urologists or whatever specialists that they have. They have a long list of them. But if that subscriber were to call that office and they say, oh, no, we're close to new enrollees. No, we're close to new enrollees. And you keep running down that list. And the reality is that those doctors are on their roster, but those doctors aren't seeing their patients. And so that's that's a little uh, nuance in the in the writing of the contracts that allows them to be able to get by with providing substandard service to them and increase their profit revenues of the profit revenues of the uh, of the MCOs. And then you, here's a funny story. I was at a national convention and um, I was in this practice management conference uh, session. And they were talking about really how to more efficiently run your practice. And one of the problems that I have is a high no-show rate, particularly among those people who have Medicaid. And I do believe that there is some truth to the fact that if you don't have any skin in the game, you don't take it for, you take it, take the service for granted. And, and I do see a lot of that with Medicaid. And we can talk about some of that uh, philosophy a little bit later too. But um, I asked a question to one of the panelists who happens to be um, office manager in one of the practices around here in Nashville. She didn't know who I was. I knew who she was. 
And I said, so how do you address then the, uh, the high no-show rate, particularly among Medicaid patients? And she said, simple, stop seeing Medicaid. She's like, we don't see Medicaid anymore. There's a guy down in Nashville who we send all of our Medicaid patients to. And I'm like, hey, this guy here. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you say it with pride, but she's like, we, we are full. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we full. <laughs> Go somewhere, we full. <laughs> But but th th that's the reality of it is that, you know, if you go and look up on the provider network, guess who was listed? That office was listed, but they're listed in name only. So the, the, the state is allowing these MCOs to get away with having sham names of providers on their on their provider list who cannot adequately provide the care to the number of patients that they have, a number of subscribers that they have. I should not be the only one in Nashville providing ENT care to, um, to patients with Medicaid. Well, there's one other, there's one other, there's Nashville General, but they don't even have a, the hospital. They don't even have an ENT on staff. They don't have a physician on staff. In fact, now they didn't even have a nurse practitioner or PA on staff uh, because now they're trying to regroup and everything. But what happens when those people need to have surgeries? Guess what they do? They send them over to right down here. One guy who will accept the Medicaid in the city. So the, the system is broken because it is right now administered by people who are driven by profits. And the state is not necessarily the states. And I'm not sure. I'm sure it's not just in Tennessee. The states aren't you know, carefully monitoring and 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 um, policing the MCOs to make sure that they are doing what they are paid billions of dollars to do. Well, and like we talked about um, with Medicaid, um, you have to have the state buy-in. So a lot, a lot of states are not even wanting to expand Medicaid or even use Medicaid for that matter. And I did want to correct something. When I say the South Side, I do mean South Side of Atlanta, not necessarily Georgia. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're, if you as a state don't even want to, you know, to use some of those federal funds to buy into Medicaid, um, so that you can have access for your residents, then yeah, you're not too much interested in making sure some of those, um, policies or some of those, um, guidelines are met. And, now you say you as a state don't want to, the reality is it's the state legislature doesn't want to. Yeah. <laughs> and so we have to be very cautious about who we are electing as our state legislators, because a lot of them will start, you know, this whole thing, if they like to quote the Bible and say, you know, when they, when they want, you know, to pass pro-life and anti-abortion legislation, but they don't want to quote the Bible when they talk about services to the poor and, and how you care for the poor. There are abundance and overabundance of scriptures that talk about caring for the poor. In Exodus, it talks about how, you know, for six years you'll reap and you'll, you'll, uh, clear the land. I think in the seventh, in the seventh year it says, don't even reap any of that. Leave it there for all of the poor people to come in and take of it. And Leviticus, I think it talks about how every time you reap your land, don't reap to the borders of it. You know, leave the leave the edges there so that the poor people can come and get it. Um, and and when you after you cleared out the land, don't even go back and catch the other grapes that have fallen through the ground. It says, but it says rather let those people who are poor come and partake of those things. It doesn't say require that they work. It just says leave it there. It doesn't place a condition on how you administer charity to the poor. It just says do it. It doesn't say stop doing it if you find that people abuse it because they they're coming to take up it says do it and so if you really want to say that you are driven by and your christian values then you would do it even if you saw that some people would be uh abusing it because people are gonna abuse every system that you put in place it's just a matter who gets away with abusing it the poor or the uber wealthy which i know a lot of people will probably argue oh this is also the the fault of physicians because they charge too much. Um, and perhaps whatever you get in Medicaid is probably the actual <laughs> compensation or cost of, of the service, whereas it's overinflated when it comes to the general public. And I want to make sure you have an opportunity to respond to that argument. <laughs> <laughs> Hogwash. Hogwash. 
<laughs> here's, the, here's the reality. The reality is, is that any system that is uh, created by and implemented by man will be manipulated, will be exploited to the benefit of man. The question is, is who's going to be the one to benefit it? We have a problem in this country when the poor gets to benefit from exploiting uh, systems that we placed in and, and into place uh, that we put into place. But we don't have our same problem when the when large corporations exploit it. Example, example here again. Still using the the whole analogy that you said, where uh, physicians overcharge and that Medicaid is just really paying what's actually necessary to cover this. So let's let's explore that a little bit. Let's say Medicaid is paying what it actually costs to uh, to provide that service. And I'm accepting, I'm seeing Medicaid patients and I get paid, you know, let's say I get paid a hundred dollars for a new patient visit. That's because I'm a solo practitioner and I can't negotiate better contract rates, but you know, Vanderbilt can go and say, Hey, that same patient could be seen, get the same level of care, probably less level of care because Vanderbilt's going to rush you in. And I'm not discrediting Vanderbilt. I'm just using it as an example, but Vanderbilt's going to see you and they're going to pay Vanderbilt $300 for that. Right. Why? Because Vanderbilt has more expenses. Vanderbilt has more physicians. They can negotiate. They can strong arm the insurance companies into doing it. Fine. Well, if Vanderbilt get pays three hundred dollars when I get paid only a hundred dollars, the reality of it is for one patient visit. Then the reality of it is that Vanderbilt now has an ability to utilize the healthcare system that we have, and 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 its place to better suit itself. Uh, therefore, it can probably even pay their employees better than I can pay them. They can incentivize people to come work for Vanderbilt than for me. And so now they say, wait a minute, I'm making $16 an hour working for you, Dr. Williams, and I can go over to Vanderbilt and make $19 an hour. Guess where they're going to go? They're going to go to Vanderbilt. And so eventually you wind up saying, okay, well, the poor guy, the little guy can't take advantage of the system and I'm not saying take advantage in a, in a derogatory sense, but we can't benefit from the system as well as a bigger, the big guy can. And so as a result, we wind up leaving. I closed my practice because I can't get and retain good help because I'm getting paid these pennies on the dollar relative to another place. So I move all my patients over to Vanderbilt. I go join Vanderbilt. And guess what? Now you're paying all those same patients that I was seeing that I was make, pay, getting paid $100 for. I asked you to pay me $150 for it because, you know, then I could have stayed over. I could have been a little bit more competitive with my employees. I could have retained my employees a little bit better. But you said, no, you don't want to pay me $150 for that. And so now I'm going over to Vanderbilt, taking all my patients over to Vanderbilt with me, and I'm getting paid $300, just like Vanderbilt was getting paid for each one of them. And so now I'm living high on the hog. Why? Because the poor guy, the little guy, can never really get ahead in this capitalistic society. It always the favors the person who has the muscle, who has the money. With my muscle, I mean the money and, and the influence. And so, uh, yeah, so the systems are going to be exploited as well. And they get exploited by people who come on to the system and who don't belong there. And they should actually, government should be uh, actively seeking and finding out who doesn't qualify for it. And when they don't qualify, they should kick them off. But unfortunately, the way that this is administered sometimes is administered such that uh, like Tennessee had like a 47 page application for Medicaid, 47 page. The reality is, is that a lot of people who, who, and I live in Tennessee and I see a lot of people from the hills of Tennessee who are less educated. They, they don't, they, they may not have the highest level of education or intelligence. And you're asking them to comply with a 47 page application. They, many of them can, most of the vast majority of them can, but there are some people who just are illiterate, who can't read and who can't, who don't understand these things. And so they're disadvantaged, but they're probably the ones who need it mostly because they're disadvantaged. And you got some other people over here who are just borderline or maybe some people who don't even deserve it, but have access to uh, resources and connections that allow them to partake of it. So that's the way that our system is set up, where that it favors the rich, it favors those who already have a power, it favors the MCOs who will then say, hey, 
stick it to the poor guy, the person who's actually supposed to be the one who benefits from that. We want to benefit for it more. And they do it. And the stockholders and sh shareholders they actually benefit more than the uh, than the recipients who are intended to benefit from it. So you are saying, yes, we overcharge, but blame that on capitalism. <laughs> Again, I said it doesn't matter what we charge, it's what we're going to get paid. <laughs> so this is probably the one industry in America where we're sort of insulated against um, uh, raising our charges. Most other industries, when inflation comes and they, they raise their charges, they raise the cost of their goods and service in order, and they get paid that. You know, the cost of gasoline went up. Guess what? We paid it still. When the cost of eggs went up to $8 for a do dozen, guess what? You still bought them. And they had the ability to uh, raise the price of it to $8 and you paid $8. Now, if I raise my fee to $100, it doesn't matter. If they were going to pay me $37, that's what they're still going to pay me. But my expenses went up, though, didn't they? All my expenses went up because everybody else's expenses went up. Healthcare is the one, it's the one industry in America that I'm, that I'm aware of that you cannot just willy nilly raise your uh, the, the the primary Medicare. I mean, because huh? at least not for Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah, because you can't. You can't do that. Before. You can't. You can't do it with commercial. You can't do it well, with commercial. The insurance companies raise their because I know that's often the argument is well, insurance companies their premiums are too high. We hear that over and over again. I know Obama would talk about how hey, with the Affordable Care Act, hopefully we can get some of these premiums down. But we we saw it come down maybe shortly, but then it started raising back up. Um, and so there's an increase somewhere happening. Cause and do you think that, <laughs> and I, I will tell you that that increase did not go to the doctors for delivery of well, care. You said you know, Vanderbilt or certain doctors will negotiate um, their, their rates or negotiate better with the insurance, which is interesting that considering that you probably have a lot more demand in this Medicaid market, can't negotiate based on that demand. I, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. That's unfortunate because if, if you go, then we we if if Medicaid is important to even the government, that's a whole group of people that no longer have that access, at least in that area. Um, and then we are of course forcing them to not only go further, uh, it's usually on the north side, but then we're also the Medicaid is having to pay more. <laughs> you know, and so you know it's interesting that you can't negotiate that. But but I, I'm still saying like. I guess we as Americans, we're still trying to understand, okay, well, there's an increase happening here. And I know you talked about there are big corporations, big hospitals that can negotiate um, better than, than certain the small men. So someone's getting this increase. <laughs> yeah, well, well, so once you have a contract with them, then that contract is going to be enforced for whatever, for, for three years or whatever else. And the reality is, is that you can still raise your prices, but you're raising your prices doesn't mean that that's what you're going to get paid. You're going to get paid what the insurance company determines. So any other any other industry, they can look and say that this is what my need is. This is how my expenses have gone up. This is how much I need to incre increase the cost of my goods and service to meet that. And then they can set it. And then the public determines whether or not that, that uh, increase is tolerable or not. And the public determines that. But in this case, in healthcare, the public doesn't determine whether or not that increase is manageable or tolerable. The corporations, the insurance companies determine whether we whether they feel that that increase is tolerable. And the way that they determine if it's tolerable, not because of what the public demands, but because of what their shareholders demand. This is how I, I call insurance companies, and I and, you know I don't mean to. To, to disparage, disparage them too much. I call them gangsters. The reason why is because uh, they've got a nice little setup. What they'll do is they'll say, you pay the premium to us, but we don't ever deliver the care directly to you. The care is delivered by somebody else. And so if you don't like the care that you received, you go on ahead and you file that complaint with you. You're upset with the person who delivered the care, not the one who you paid for that care. And so what happens is the insurance companies get to keep their hands clean and you're paying $1,500 a month for healthcare premiums. You expect $1,500 a month worth of care uh, when you, when you when go you to that in, doctor. You finally get injured, right? Yeah, but oh, when you- the deductible that you have to pay before you- <laughs> Exactly. And I totally get it. I expect that. 
But the reality is, is you're expecting that from me. I didn't get the $1,500. If I got that $1,500, I'll give you every bit of care that you're expecting right now. But the reality is I got paid $68 <laughs> to deliver this care for you. And now you've taken up a half an hour of time when you were only booked for, uh, for a 15-minute appointment. And really, I wish I could have gotten you in and out in seven minutes. If I could have, many other places you go would have gotten you in and out in seven minutes for that $68 that you paid. And so now you're upset with me because, you know, you, you have a level of expectation that I'm not being compensated enough to provide for you. And why do you have that expectation? Because every month you write that check and you expect something in return. But the person who's delivering the care is not the one you wrote the check to. Therein lies that the the beauty of insurance and how they've got it handled because they're you're going to get upset with me you're not going to get upset with your insurance company and so i quickly tell people you need to discuss that with your insurance company <laughs> <laughs> well and i know we're going to run a long time but I, I, i'd be interested to see what some of these contracts look like um and, and i mean i'm not that I'm, I'm expecting the doctors to then send it to me because, you know, I said the lawyer part of me is saying, well, surely there is something built in the contract that does um, talk about either liabilities or talk about certain expenses or, or, or something that gives some incentive for the physician beyond just, okay, this is what we'll give you every month, or this is the, the, the patients that will make sure comes there. The incentive is that you get to see our patients. And in, in the old days, the way that the way that healthcare went, you could actually sell a medical practice and could sell it for a good amount of money. Because when you went to see a doctor, uh, you became that quote unquote, for lack of a better expression, um, you became that doctor's patients. And so doctors had patients. And uh, but doctors don't have patients anymore because there was some loyalty to that doctor. Like, well, that was our doctor. That was my mother's doctor. And now my children's doctor, we all go to this doctor. But the reality of it is, is that if that doctor is not in now, is now not in network with your insurance, guess what? You're going to find another doctor because the insurance company dictates where you go to some extent. And no matter how good you think that doctor is, you might stick around with them a couple of times you know, a short period of time and be like, yeah, I'm going to pay out of pocket because I really like you, doc. But at some point <laughs> you're like, eh, I'm, I'm sure I can find another doctor that I like as well. So the insurance company is dictating all of our behaviors. It's dictating what your expectation is. It's dictating where you will go for your care. It's dictating for the, for the doctors who they can see and who they cannot see. So the insurance company has all the power in this situation. Uh, well, but yeah, sure there are some doctors that don't that cash only that they don't yeah. even deal with the insurance. I mean, what do you even think about that? Because I know we're straying a little bit from the social programs, but you know, I guess I'm, I'd imagine if again one of the reasons why you're saying this is different from other types of industries is because there wasn't that direct line. Then kind of speak on was the importance of having the direct line because you know if you can see if you got a couple of patients that are willing to pay cash. Then and and that cash is going to be the full amount and not your sixty eight bucks. Right. <laughs> you know, um, go ahead and and speak on that. Then. So there are these things called concierge practices, and mostly they're primary care, uh, because you're going to see a primary care doctor. Some people multiple times in a year, twelve times in a year, or something. Or some people come to the doctor once a month. And so they really utilize that care uh, and have access to that, to have access to that doctor and however much time you need to spend with that doctor. So some people will pay $1,500 a year just for that purpose. I can go see the doctor whenever I need to see the doctor and I don't feel rushed. And all you, how you really have to do is get a hundred, a thousand people at $1,500 a year and you're making good money, <laughs> you know, you know, and, and on top of that, your life is so much better. You're much more pleasant. You're not, you know, you're not grinding. You're not, you know, burning yourself out, trying to see more and more patients. You're delivering better health care. Uh, it's a little bit difficult for a specialist to do that, especially uh, one who don't see patients repeatedly in a year. If I charge my $1,500 a year, to see uh to see me and all of their services were covered in that um some some people would make out real big like a fat cat because they had a really big surgery and they only pay fifteen hundred dollars for it some people will be grossly overpaying because they've only seen me one time and all they got was a nose spray that's available over the counter 
Yeah. <laughs> I want to look into these countries because that means we're paying more than that in our premiums. You're paying more than that. Yeah. <laughs> Than you pay, but it doesn't cover how it doesn't co cover hospitalization it's only your outpatient care and so um so that's one of the downsides to it but there are people who are actually starting to say hey i think this is a better method for my health care delivery but some people still will then have to have some type of catastrophic insurance so that if you are involved in a accident or needed to be hospitalized for surgical care or something like that then that is there but my, my issue is this, is that when we start uh, monetizing charity, there's a problem with it. And, and I think the base, the basis of our country and the drive of capitalism is to monetize everything. And humanity should never be monetized, I think. And, and the minute that we do that, we do that with the administration of Medicare. We do that with the administration of Medicaid. Uh, those are problems. I think it just needs to be, we need to have a uh, conviction that if you are an American citizen, you should be able to have access to quality health care, regardless of your ability to pay for it. So we shouldn't be all upset when FICA takes all this money out of our paycheck because <laughs> it's going to these social programs. <laughs> Even though we hear people say, I don't remember them putting in their 40 hours a week, but nonetheless. It, if it, we were Christians, we should, because right. that's what that's what he told us. He said, leave some of your harvest there for the poor. And but we're not Christians at heart. And so <laughs> so cut out the pr pretension. <laughs> And so for the record, um, because again, this is going to be a, a political topic. It continues to be a political topic every time the budget starts coming up in Congress. You would not be for cutting Medicaid because I know that's something a lot of Republicans are talked about, not only in the states, but also in the federal level. I, I personally believe that uh, we should do what the Bible tells us to do is to take care of the poor and to take care of the widows and the elderly. We should do those types of things. And we should definitely make sure that it's not being exploited to the extent that we can. Exploited by the consumers, also exploited by those organizations, those for-profit organizations that we hire and pay trillions of dollars or billions of dollars each year to administer only so that they can line the pockets of their shareholders. It's a problem. Well, and Margie Taylor Green, since you're in Georgia, if you're listening, we do not want to cut Medicaid. <laughs> Yeah, she wants to cut it. Yes. But, uh, and, and this this whole notion about you, you, if you have to work to be eligible for it, I'm not opposed to that necessarily. Uh, but there are some people who are just incapable of working. You know, disability, those persons who are disabled children, they should still be able to have access to it. And we didn't even talk about the whole aspect of what if you are an immigrant in this country? And what if you're undocumented? Should you be able to have access to you know, some of these same social services. If we were a, a God-fearing and and charitable nation, just as we profess, we like to profess that we are when we're talking about or abortion issues, then we should be doing the same thing as it, care, as it applies to caring for the poor and for the foreigners in our land. And I don't doubt, and I know, again, I know we're running low, but I don't doubt to be eligible. There is so many or so much red tape you got to go through. I, I I don't doubt that you do have to show why you cannot work. Because I mean, I just can't imagine, again, with a lot of these government programs, even like with the welfare program, there are so many questions to try to eliminate people who are just choosing not to work um, to be eligible for, for, for this. And so I don't doubt that in that 47 page or however many pages you got to fill out to be to qualify for Medicaid or Medicare, that you do have to show... Um, that you meet the the qualifications of either being unable to work or in your child, you're, you, you know, not <laughs> having the skills to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I know I'm giving the government a little bit credit for that, but I just also feel like we as a country, because we're so capitalist, because we're so, oh no, it's it's everyone should be able to achieve the American dream and, and it's on you to do it, that you forget. Now, not everyone is born with the same privilege or the same opportunities or even the same limbs. <laughs> Yeah. As people. And, and you know you built into it that the, the system is going to be cheated i think i saw somewhere a statistic or whatever, like if they went and recouped all of the money that they um had for fraud it was one state it was, they'd probably bring in about 900 million dollars 
Oh, if, not no, not hundred. What was it? If New York can get Trump to pay out all the money he owes for his fraud case, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, and, and you said it. I mean, corporations uh, are even the Trumps. When you misrepresent assets. Again, you're doing just as bad as someone who is seeking Medicare or Medicaid if you if it's under this whole philosophy of, hey, they didn't earn it. Yeah, but it, it was a, something where I can't remember what the exact numbers were, but the amount that they would recoup from fraud was about one fifth of the amount that they spent on investigating the fraud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna figure that. And, and that was, but reasons, we got them. We got them. So. That was one of the reasons why Biden hired more IRS people. And then he had the rich saying, no, do not hire more IRS. And the <laughs> reason why is because <laughs> they don't because they want to No, they want, <laughs> if somebody's going to game the system, they need to have money and they need to have power. And that's the, that's the, that's the bottom line to it is that it's okay. You know, the system is going to get gamed. It's just a matter of who's tolerable to game it. And so that's what our legislators do. As long as you got enough money to make contributions to my campaign, you can game the system. <laughs> Trump is saying, hey, my wallet is wide open. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting all those annual six months out of there, right? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> well, thanks so much for sharing some of your experiences as it relates to Medicaid. And of course, you know, those listening, if you have any questions or feedback, we would love to hear some of the comments. We're probably going to spend a couple more episodes, maybe not the next episode, but we're going to definitely talk about social welfare programs as we get more into this election year because we know that that's something that's <laughs> will continue always to on all right so if there are some um in some programs specifically that you guys want us to address feel free to let us know we can see what we can do based on my friends and whatever <laughs> acquaintances <with> mark <laughs> uh, i can't it, have friends <laughs> <laughs> hey you said it um, but until next Saturday, um, don't forget to check us out on your favorite podcast platform. Also, don't forget to take a repeat of this episode on Star Radio. Feel free to go to YouTube. Make sure you are subscribed there. And until next Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you guys so much for tuning in.